الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما نافعا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has through his infinite mercy grace allowed us to come together once again for this program of Dars al-Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to allow us to recite the Qur'an, study the Qur'an, discuss the lessons of the Qur'an and allow us to apply these lessons into our lives. May Allah keep us attached to the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, we just went through the month of Qur'an. Now it is upon us to maintain this connection throughout the year. Allah make it easy for all of us. Inshallah, this is just one of those links by which we can stay connected to the Qur'an. Every Friday night, inshallah, we come together and uh, recite some of the verses of the Qur'an and discuss the lessons that are within them. Uh, prior to Ramadan, when we um, put the program on hold for the month of Ramadan, we had completed Juz Amma. We completed the 30th Juz and we finished that Surah An-Nas. And now we are resuming uh, if you were paying attention, I just recited the opening verses of Surah Al-Fatih. Surah Al-Fatih is a surah in the 26th Juz. And inshallah, I intend with the will of Allah, with the courage and ability, tawfiq that Allah gives, I intend to resume from Surah Al-Fatih and we'll, we'll work our way again towards the end. Because some people say from Surah Al-Fatih, some people say from Surah Al-Hujurat, which is the following Surah. Um, some people say from Surah Qaf, two Surahs later. Uh, this part of the Qur'an, from this surah or the next surah till the end of the Qur'an is called the Mufassalat. The last one-seventh of the Qur'an is called the Mufassalat. Mufassalat are uh, the, again, the, the chapters of the Qur'an that are contained within these uh, final parts, right, from the end of the 26th juz all the way till the end of the 30th. These surahs the Prophet 
would recite them frequently, the Surah of Mufassalat. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, I believe, radiallahu anhu, said that there is no Surah of the Mufassalat except that I heard the Prophet sallallahu reciting it in the prayer. So he would recite these surahs, especially in the Fajr prayer, the surah of the surah, the, the chapters of Mufassalat. These last surahs from the 26 Jews onwards, he would recite these uh, surahs in the prayer. Uh, and uh, that shows the, the deep connection uh, that the Prophet ﷺ had and this Ummah has more specifically with the last portion of the Qur'an, the Mufassalat, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ would recite them repeatedly. And also because um, there is a, a very strong, um, you know, message regarding the the hereafter, a very uh, there is a constant theme within these surahs um, regarding the end of this world, the hereafter, the stations of the hereafter, the eventual day, day of judgment. As we go through these surahs, we will see, especially towards the end, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats again and again the day of judgment and the, the hellfire, paradise, and the repeated mention of what human beings are going to experience after they transition from this world, after death. So, and because this is the last ummah, and not only the last ummah, we're pretty much uh, now in the last part of the last ummah, right? Towards the end of times. And therefore, it seems so much more relevant to. Um, be continuously reciting these surahs, understanding the message of these surahs, and reminding ourselves of the important stages of our life that are um, coming, that we will confront after our death. And therefore these surahs become so much more relevant, and possibly why the Prophet would recite them again and again, because of the vivid reminders of the hereafter within these surahs. Nevertheless, Inshallah, um, we will go through these surahs together slowly, bit by bit. It will take a while, but Inshallah, it should be beneficial. I, in, I intended to start with Surah al fat Like I was saying, some people say the Mufassalat starts from the next surah, Surah Hujurat. But Surah al fat which is surah before Surah al Hujurat, is a very um, you know, encouraging surah. Right, especially in the situations that we find ourselves now, today. So I thought it would be very relevant to start with the Surah, Surah Al-Fat. Surah Al-Fat means victory. al fath means victory. Because there is a, a clear victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in this Surah. When He begins the Surah by saying, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Indeed, we have given you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a clear victory. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. And because the, the first verse mentions this victory, the surahs, most of this, the majority of the surah um, speaks about incidents that are related to this victory that is being referred to in this surah. And this is why the surah's name is Surah Al-Fatih. It was one of the latter surahs to be revealed and more specifically this whole surah was revealed um, upon returning from Sulh al this very significant event and this is why it's important that we um, have a picture of this event of Sulh al-Hudaybiyah if we want to understand the verses of this surah because the majority of the verses are related to one part or another of this very special journey, the journey of Sulh al Hudaybiyah. And so, inshallah, we'll try to summarize this incident or this whole journey uh, as a background for this surah. Inshallah, if we keep that in mind, then the verses of the surah, we will easily be able to relate them to uh, the incident. 
Um, and because um, the incident of Sulh al Hudaybiyah, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, Jabir radiallahu anhu, and other Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they uh, said that you people, speaking to the Muslims later on, you people consider the great victory to be the victory of Mecca. And the victory of Mecca took place almost two years after Sulh al Hudaybiyah. But Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and other Sahaba, they would say that you people consider the great victory of the Muslims to be the conquering of Mecca when the Muslims entered Mecca, Mecca victorious. This was in the eighth year uh, after the migration, eighth year of Hijrah, approximately two or, and a little more years before the demise of the Prophet So he would say, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, that you people consider Fatuh Mecca to be the great victory, but we the Sahaba, we considered and we deemed Sulh al Hudaybiyah to be the great victory. Although some commentators will say that this first verse is referring to the victory of Mecca. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. This is a when the verses were revealed, this was a prophecy, a prediction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was promising to the Prophet that we have given you a clear victory, meaning Fatuh Mecca, meaning Mecca is about to be conquered in a short while, two years later. So the, the victory of Mecca was being alluded to in this verse. But other Sahaba would say, no, this verse actually is speaking about Sulh al Hudaybiyah, that we have given you a clear victory, uh, which is Sulh al Hudaybiyah, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud would say, this is what the Prophet Allah was referring to as a clear victory. But for the Sahaba at that time when these verses were revealed it didn't look anything like a victory it looked like a clear defeat but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling the Sahaba that we have given and the Prophet وسلم, that we have given you a clear victory and the Sahaba are seeing clear defeat in front of their eyes and it's ironic but this is a lesson for us to learn that sometimes things look like, uh, seem apparently in a certain uh, way to us, but the decision of Allah is totally different from what we see. Sometimes we may see scenes of defeat, scenes of, you know, um, oppression, scenes of um, subjugation, scenes of injustice. But behind that, there will be like uh, the result of all of this in the, in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is great good that will come out from all of it, right? And this whole incident of Sulh al Hudaybiyah and what it resulted in is a very good example of this. That sometimes what we see as a defeat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In, in the knowledge and in the eyes of Allah that is actually a victory for Islam and the Muslims. And therefore, um, this was a reminder to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum too that you should remain, uh, your trust should stay, you should continue to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will change defeat into victory and keep your trust in Allah, maintain your faith in Allah. This was a very challenging moment when these verses were revealed, as you will see. So inshallah, we'll briefly summarize the incident. I don't think we can uh, carry on with the verses today, inshallah, we'll continue next week. But for now, uh, just a brief summary of the incident of Sulh al Hudaybiyah, so that we can understand in what context these verses were revealed. And you will see that the verses are saying something and outwardly, externally, the Sahaba were experiencing something totally different. The incident of Sulh al Hudaybiyah, it all started out, and this incident occurred in the sixth year, like I was saying, two years before Fatwa Makkah, in the sixth year of Hijrah. Um, uh, so you have the 12 or 13 years of the Prophet ﷺ living in Mecca through 
the years of persecution and in the 12th year the hijrah begins in the 12th and the 13th year the hijrah to Medina occurs and then the 10 years of Medina where the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba stayed in Medina and in the beginning of the 11th year is the demise of the Prophet Sallallahu so it was toward the end of the Madani period where this incident occurred more specifically in the 6th year in the month of Dhul Qa'da Dhul Qa'da um, uh, the, after Ramadan, Shawwal and then Dhul Qa'da that's when this journey took place and it all began when the Prophet ﷺ saw a dream and he saw while he was in Medina he saw himself and the Sahaba عنهم, traveling to Mecca performing the Umrah and after the Umrah taking off their ihrams by shaving their head or cutting their hair, trimming their hair. And all of this was done in a state of extreme like ease, safety and security. Now, we have to understand that in the sixth year of Hijrah, Mecca was still ruled by the disbelievers of Mecca, the idol worshippers. The Kaaba was full of idols. The whole of Mecca was uh, ruled by these persecutors, these oppressors, right? These evil people. And the Muslims were in Medina. This is when the Prophet ﷺ is seeing this dream that the Sahaba have entered Mecca, performed Umrah, shaved their head, uh, and uh, in, in, ex in um, extreme ease and peace, with extreme ease and peace. When the Prophet ﷺ awoke the next morning, when he met the Sahaba, ﷺ, he narrated this dream to them. And they all knew that the dream of the Prophet ﷺ and the dream of all Prophets is actually revelation from Allah. Meaning it's wahi. And it, it will always come true. When the Prophet ﷺ narrated this dream, this created an extreme desire within the Sahaba ﷺ to proceed to Makkah for Umrah. Regardless of the situation in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ has seen a dream that's it, it's going to happen. Now, the Prophet ﷺ saw this whole scene, but he was not told in the dream when it would happen. That, was, that is a key factor. In the dream it was not mentioned that when this scene will play out of Umrah. He was shown this whole scene, the Prophet ﷺ himself and the Sahaba ﷺ, because remember they had left everything back in Mecca six years ago when they migrated and they never went back. It's like they never went back to their homeland, especially the Muhajireen. So they were, uh, like their, their desire had almost come to a climax to go and visit Mecca once again, the house of Allah, the, the Kaaba, to do tawaf, to perform the pilgrimage because they were not allowed. They were banned, right? The Muslims, they were at war with the Meccans for the last six years. Significant wars took place. Badr took place in the second year. Uhud the following year. Ahzab and many Ahzab one year before. Sulh al And then many other incidents. So this was, uh, they were in a state of war with the Meccans. And in this, uh, in this uh, context, the Prophet ﷺ is seeing this dream. And therefore the Sahaba radiallahu were convinced that if the Prophet ﷺ has seen this, that means we are going to Mecca. That means we are going back to our homeland. We will be able to perform Umrah and no one is going to do anything to us because the Prophet ﷺ's dream is wahi. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw the Sahabas uh, become extremely enthusiastic to uh, take upon this journey and the Prophet ﷺ also was not told when this would happen. He also... Uh, um, went along with the Sahaba anhum's desire and people started making preparations. The Sahaba became prepared to make this journey to Mecca. The Prophet also made his preparations. He took his wife Umm Salama anha with him and the Prophet uh, in the um, uh, earlier part of Dhul Qa'da, right? Uh, before Dhul Hijjah, the 11th month, Dhul Qa'da. In the earlier part of Dhul Qa'da, the Prophet ﷺ made preparations with the Sahaba to travel to Mecca for the purpose of Umrah. That was their only intention. They did not have any intention to engage in any combat 
against uh, with the disbelievers of Mecca. The preparations were made. The Prophet ﷺ put on new clothing, uh, uh, got his qaswa, his camel that he usually traveled on, and they proceeded from Medina and they got to Dhul Hulifa, and that is where the the miqat is, the station from where the pilgrims put on their uh, clothing for pilgrimage, the ihram. The Prophet ﷺ put his ihram from there and they proceeded um, from Medina. Right, uh, from Dhul Hilifa in the state of Ihram. They also had the animals that they intended to sacrifice in the Haram after their Umrah. They're called the Hadi animals, the sacrificial animals. They had also taken them along uh, with this whole procession. The commentators say there's a difference of opinion uh, in regards to the number. Some people say 1400 Sahaba were with the Prophet, and others say 1500. Sahaba radiallahu anhum, 1200 were on foot and 200 or 300 were on horseback, right? Uh, with this whole, uh, basically it was like an army proceeding. And they had weapons, but not significant because again, they did not have any intentions to go to war with the Meccans. Uh, but they did carry their weapons with them. And as they proceeded, uh, because the Meccans had their sources through which they would uh, constantly receive information as to what is going on in Medina, what are the Muslims doing. They received the news that the Prophet ﷺ with 14 or 1500 of his companions is proceeding towards Mecca. And he intends to, um, I mean, he received the news of their intention. But this was like a challenge to the Meccans. When the Meccans heard this, they became furious. They uh, initial their knee-jerk reaction. Initial reaction was, "We are never going to let this happen." Right? That if the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba are able to come into Mecca, perform their pilgrimage, and return, this will be like a defeat for us. The news will spread throughout Arabia that the Meccans have been defeated. The Muslims have entered Mecca, they performed their Umrah and they went back and no one did anything to them. This would be like a clear defeat to the Meccans and they would never be able to tolerate this. So their initial reaction was, we're never going to let this happen. The Prophet ﷺ continued to proceed towards Mecca. The Meccans prepared an army uh, at the head of Khalid ibn al-Walid who had not accepted Islam yet. Khalid ibn al-Walid with many of the warriors and soldiers of Mecca and they spread the news in the uh, nearby areas of Mecca to Ta'if, to uh, the tribe of Khuza'a, uh, to the other Bedouin tribes that were living around Mecca that look, Muhammad وسلم, is coming with his companions and they are about to attack Mecca. They spread this propaganda news that they're coming to attack the Haram, the Mecca, the Kaaba, and therefore we must prepare to defend the house of Allah, right? The Kaaba, Mecca. So anyone would be prepared that how can they do this? So the people of Ta'if, slowly there was an army, a, a, a group from Ta'if that joined Khalid ibn al-Walid's army. There were some groups from the Bedouin tribes, they also joined Khalid ibn al-Walid and his uh, group of soldiers. And slowly a small army was prepared by the Meccans. This army proceeded outside of Mecca to a place called Qura al Ghamim, where they were going to anticipate and intercept this whole procession from Medina. They would stop them and not allow them to come close to Mecca. On the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ also he had a Sahabi who uh, was sent to see what the situation was in Mecca. Bishr ibn Sufyan and he gathered all the news of what is going on in Mecca, all the preparations and Khalid ibn al-Walid's army and he returned to the Prophet Sallallahu while he was proceeding and he conveyed all the information to the Prophet Sallallahu that this is the reaction of the Meccans and this is what they are prepared to do. They're, they want to go to war. They're not going to let you enter. The Prophet Sallallahu said that we have not come with the intention of war. We've only come with the intention of pilgrimage, to perform the pilgrimage in return. And um, the Meccans, why are they responding like this? They should leave me 
have not years of war weakened the Meccans, they should leave me and let me engage with the rest of Arabia. And if the rest of the Arabs, they overcome me, then this will be a victory for the Meccans. And if I overcome the rest of Arabia, then this will be a victory for them too. And they can accept Islam or if they want, they can then engage with war, in war against me once again. But at least they will have some time to make preparations, gain strength once again after the years of war have, have weakened them. So in this way, the Prophet ﷺ, um, he had this conversation. In other words, he was trying to say that send this message to the Meccans. That this is what my intent is. And it is better for you too that you don't engage in any warfare right now and let me do what I have intended to do on this journey. Nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ proceeded and eventually they came close enough to uh, uh, be confronted with the army of Khalid ibn al Walid. The Prophet ﷺ prepared some of the Sahaba عنهم, who could stand. Uh, in opposition to the army of Khalid ibn Walid, but there was no confrontation there. Eventually, the Prophet ﷺ again sent this message to Khalid ibn Walid and his men that look, we have not come with the intention of fighting and we have no intention, we only have come for the purpose of Umrah. They, their response was that we will never let you let enter Mecca, we won't let this happen. Um, the Prophet ﷺ, in trying to avoid any altercation with Khalid's army, the Prophet ﷺ changed his course a little and he tried to um, go, he tried to approach Makkah from another uh, direction, from the direction of Hudaybiyah, which today is called Ashamsiyah. Uh, this was right at the outskirts of the Haram, like the sacred area, which is beyond obviously. Uh, the Masjid al-Haram, it, it's approximately 12-13 kilometers out uh, uh, in some directions, not in all directions. But this sacred precinct, right, um, which is called the Haram, the whole sacred area, uh, Hudaybiyah is situated so close to the Haram. Some people actually say a part of Shamsiya uh, Hudaybiyah is inside the Haram and part of it is outside the Haram. Nevertheless, the Prophet Sallallahu um, took his uh, uh, companions and went towards Hudaybiyah. When he approached Hudaybiyah, he got to a place in Hudaybiyah where while he was traveling, his camel either slipped or sat down after uh, some incident. The camel slipped and sat down. When the Prophet ﷺ tried to get the camel to stand up to continue proceeding towards Mecca, the camel refused. The Sahaba whom tried to um, uh, get the camel to stand up and the camel refused again they started saying oh prophet of Allah leave this camel the camel has become stubborn right meaning that you can't use this camel now it's acting up the prophet Hassan responded by saying this camel is not stubborn and this is not the habit of this camel this qaswa the prophet Hassan knew the qaswa and the qaswa knew the prophet and the prophet Hassan understood right now Till now, even the Prophet ﷺ, along with the Sahaba, again, they have this impression that because of this dream that was seen, that they're going to be entering Makkah, they're going to be doing Umrah, shaving their heads and returning, slaughtering their animals, the sacrificial animals, and returning to Medina safe and secure. So until now, uh, even the Prophet ﷺ, in his mind, this is the whole scene that they're anticipating. But currently, it doesn't look like it's happening. Right, with the obstacle and the um, uh, you know, confrontation of Khalid ibn al-Walid and the fact that the Meccans are ready for war. It doesn't look apparently like this, this, this is going to happen. But still the hopes are very high because again the Sahaba, they knew that the Prophet ﷺ has seen a dream, it has to happen. And they're all thinking it's going to happen right now. Because we have come for Umrah and the dream is going to be fulfilled. It's going to come true no matter what. So they have these extreme high emotions, high hopes, right? Almost like it's already done. The, the Prophet ﷺ also. But when this incident occurred, then something occurred to the Prophet ﷺ that this camel is not moving ahead towards Makkah. And usually it doesn't do this. It does not. 
go against my directives. And if the camel has sat down and is not getting up, this is some indication that maybe this is not the time when this dream is going to be fulfilled. That's, that's the moment where this may have occurred to the Prophet He said that this camel, its habit is not to be stubborn like this, and it would not do this. This camel has been stopped by the one who has stopped the people of the elephants. Habasahu habisul fil. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ is trying to say that Allah has commanded this camel. Innaha ma'mura. Allah has commanded this camel. It is Allah who has stopped this camel from going ahead towards Makkah. The one who had stopped the elephants. Ashabul fi, the people of the elephants who had come to destroy the Kaaba. He has stopped this camel too. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, By Allah, if the people of Quraysh are ready to make a truce with me and make conditions with me, I will accept any of their conditions that have to do with preserving the sacredness of the Haram, of the Kaaba, right? And the sacredness of the Sha'air, right? The signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any conditions they put so that we can preserve the sacredness of this place, I will be ready to accept. And the Prophet ﷺ then intended to camp in Hudaybiyah and not proceed ahead. So this is what exactly what happened. The camel then stood up. The Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba to um, settle down in Hudaybiyah. And they all settled down. Hudaybiyah was a place then where there was very little water. Uh, uh, this whole journey, we've... we've um, skipped a lot of aspects of it we're just trying to summarize it but this whole journey there were uh, many uh, incidents that took place blessed occasions many miracles of the Prophet that uh, um, the Sahaba saw on this journey and this is why this was a very special journey very blessed journey one of the miracles was when the Prophet was in Hudaybiyah when they camped there uh, the Khalid ibn al-Walid and his army had taken over all the areas where water was available and the only place in Hudaybiyah that was available for the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba there was very little water and this was of concern to the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba there was a well that had almost dried up the Prophet ﷺ, he gargled water in his mouth and he rinsed it into the well and he gave one of his arrows and he said that um, um, you know, put this arrow into the well, like um, drive it into the bottom of the well, the arrow. As soon as the Sahaba anhum did this, the well started gushing forth with water. To such an extent, the water came up to the rim of the well and all the Sahaba, all 1400, were able to have water from there and fill all of their utensils for water. And ample water was available. The Sahaba, you know, when they saw this, this was a clear mu'jiza, miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. And while they were in Hudaybiyah, that's when um, negotiations began between the Prophet ﷺ and the people of Mecca. Basically, instead of going to war, they opened up like a diplomatic channel, right? To try to come to some mutual understanding. So the Prophet ﷺ opened up this a uh, channel of communication with the, the, the Muslim, between the Muslims and the disbelievers of Mecca. And um, this communication began. Initially, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi sent, uh, not initially, but uh, from the Meccans, Urwa ibn, initially, uh, Budayl ibn Waraqa. There were a couple of ambassadors that came to discuss the matter with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Initially, Budayl ibn Waraqa al-Khuza'i, who was also, who had joined forces with the Meccans, he came, he was a great leader, and in, eventually he also accepted Islam later on. Uh, but he came right now on behalf of the Meccans to speak to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi when he met Budayl ibn Waraqa in Hudaybiyah, he went through that whole conversation that he had before that look we have only come with the intention of Umrah we are not here to fight the Meccans why would we fight the Meccans they have gone so weak and you know it is better for them that they uh, make a truce with me and let me engage with the other people and that whole conversation that it is better for them if they leave me alone if they want they can regain their strength replenish 
their forces and then if they still want to fight I will be ready to go to war with them uh, and I will be ready to combat them until the last man even I am the if even if I am the last man standing I will fight for this deen right if they prevent me and if they try to stop me so Budayl ibn Waraqa saw this determination he also saw that truly the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba because he saw all these sacrificial animals with the signs that they're going to be sacrificed in the haram after the pilgrimage. So he realized that the Meccans were not speaking the truth, they were lying. The Prophet ﷺ was not coming to attack the Meccans, he actually was only coming for the pilgrimage. So he also realized that he was deceived into joining this army. He went back and took this message to the Meccans saying that, look, he's not here to fight, right? Just let him in. For they can perform their umrah in return and you know this is better for you people the Meccans were uh, so adamant stubborn that no we will never let him in we will go to war with him the Meccans sent after Budayl ibn Raqqa they sent Urwa ibn Mas'ud al thaqafi uh, who, who was from Banu Thaqif Ta'if he had a similar conversation Urwa ibn Mas'ud there are narrations of his uh, discussion with the Prophet ﷺ. when he came to meet the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't only come to, he knew, obviously, he had heard the message of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ repeated the same message to Urwa ibn Mas'ud, but he also came to observe the whole army that was with the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba. He saw the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, because he stayed there for a period of time. He saw the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when the Prophet ﷺ would perform wudu, the water that would fall off the limbs of the Prophet ﷺ, they wouldn't allow that water to fall on the ground they would catch the water and rub it over their bodies. This is how uh, you know, passionate the Sahaba عنهم, were in their respect and reverence for the Prophet ﷺ. If he would spit, they would try to catch his saliva right, as a blessing. And Urwa ibn Mas'ud saw how the Sahaba عنهم, were um, treating the Prophet ﷺ. When he returned to Mecca, he came back with a similar message and he also added that by Allah I have been to many kings the Roman Empire the Persian Empire I've been there I've seen the the palaces and the kings and how they are treated but I have never seen a people that respect their king so much and honor him and rever him so much like the way the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, Muhammad, they, because they didn't believe he was the Prophet, the companions of Muhammad treat him. I haven't seen this treatment in any king's court. So he also, I mean, all of these messages that were going back to Mecca, they started having an effect on people's hearts. Right? Slowly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started casting awe in the hearts of the disbelievers. Urwa ibn Mas'ud, when he saw this also, he started having second thoughts. Like, why are we here? We were told that these people are going coming to attack Mecca. But I saw something totally different. They're not here to attack Mecca. They're here for the pilgrimage. Why are we stopping people from performing pilgrimage? This is something evil to do. This is sacrilegious. We shouldn't be doing this. We should be accommodating people who are coming for the pilgrimage, not attacking them or preventing them. Eventually, Urwa ibn Mas'ud decided that, look, if you people, Meccans, he told them, if you people are not going to listen, are not going to allow him, I'm leaving. I, I don't want anything to do with this. Urwa ibn Mas'ud took his people and went back to Ta'if. Budayl ibn Waraqa also um, left the ranks of the Meccans. He said that, you know, you people, uh, truly you have an evil intent and these people are not here for what you people say they are here for. And I don't think we should be stopping them. Likewise, one of the leaders of the Bedouin tribes, he also went to meet the Prophet ﷺ. A similar conversation took place. And he ended up with this, uh, the same conclusion that we shouldn't be preventing these people. And he also took his men and he started leaving. This caused friction in the ranks of the Meccans now. They're, because people are breaking away. They're, the truth is being revealed. And now they're seeing what, what, what the truth is. They were being lied to. And, you know, they shouldn't have any part in this, um, uh, you know, evil plan that the people of Mecca have, the disbelievers of Mecca. So while this was also happening, the Prophet ﷺ also 
wanted to send someone on his behalf to the Meccans to speak to them. Initially, he appointed Umar and said, Umar, you go and speak to them. Umar said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, like, you know, the people of Meccans hate me. Like, I'm their, you know, worst enemy, right? I did what I did when I was in Mecca. And I don't even have a significant family backing in Mecca that can protect me if I go there alone. I can suggest a person who is more influential in Mecca and who has a family backing, he would be more appropriate for the job. And he suggested that Uthman ibn Affan anhu, be sent to speak to the people of Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi accepted this opinion, this suggestion and said, yes, he is more appropriate. Uthman anhu, was given the job to go to Mecca and speak to the Meccans and, and the leaders of the Mecca. He was also given a message from the Prophet Sallallahu for the, the Muslims who were still in Mecca but they were weak, they were feeble, the women who were not able to migrate. There was still a group of Muslims who were still in Mecca. A lot of them were being persecuted, uh, but the only reason why they were still in Mecca because they had no way to migrate due to their weakness, their feebleness. So they were still, there was still a group of Muslims in Mecca. The Prophet also sent a message to them with Uthman radiallahu Uthman radiallahu anhu, initially he met with Khalid ibn al-Walid again before going to Mecca. He presented this message to Khalid ibn al-Walid. He refused. Then Uthman radiallahu anhu, on his way to Mecca, he was met by a very close uh, relative or friend of his, Aban ibn Sa'id. He came out to meet Uthman when he heard that Uthman is coming. He came out to meet him and he said that my tribe, Banu Sa'id, Aban ibn Sa'id said that all of them are willing to protect you. No one will be able to lay a hand on you when, while you are in Mecca. And the people of Aban ibn Sa'id, they came out fully armed and they pro provided like a, a protection and, and a uh, whole um, entourage for Uthman radiallahu anhu. Uthman radiallahu anhu came to Mecca in this state and uh, no one was able to lay a hand on him. He very comfortably, he stayed there for almost three days, right? So these conversations uh, went on for a number of days. Uthman radiallahu anhu stayed in Mecca for three days, meeting all the great leaders of Mecca, speaking to them one by one, conveying this message to them. And they all pretty much had the same response, refusing, there's no way we can let the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad Sallallahu come for Umrah. If he wants, he can go back. Maybe next year we'll allow him. These conversations took place. Uthman also delivered the message to the Muslims there that the Prophet Sallallahu sends his salam. And he is saying that soon Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is going to make a way out for you. Just remain patient. Soon there will be victory and you will see that all these uh, difficult hardships uh, are going to be uplifted. So this was a great encouragement to these Muslims. They also conveyed their salams to the Prophet When the three days were over and Uthman was about to return, the people of Mecca made uh, a suggestion to Uthman, saying that, Oh Uthman, you know what, before you go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hudaybiyah, why don't you do your Umrah? You're here in Mecca, right? You have your ihram on. Just perform your Umrah and finish your Umrah and go back. We'll allow you to do it. Uthman radiallahu anhu said that I can never do Umrah without the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Right? They were thinking that, oh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, he has the opportunity, he's certainly going to do Umrah, this is his passion, his desire. But they had no idea how much love and loyalty these Sahaba radiallahu anhu had for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That how could it be possible that I perform Umrah and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is in Hudaybiyah and he is not allowed to perform his Umrah. It's not possible this has never happened and he refused and he re, uh, he uh, started going back towards uh, Hudaybiyah but before he could leave Mecca there was another incident that occurred that prevented Uthman anhu, and there were some more Muslims who had snuck into Mecca to meet their relatives and to meet their family members there was approximately 10 of them they were also in Mecca attempting to leave Mecca and go back to the Muslim army. In the meantime, the Meccans had prepared some individuals, 40, 50 individuals, to try to infiltrate 
the ranks of the believers and get an opportunity to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. Like for example, while he's in prayer, when the guards around the Prophet ﷺ are unaware, try to launch an attack and assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. If he is killed, then this whole matter will be resolved. These 50 individuals approximately, they try to approach the Muslim army from a hidden area, but eventually Muhammad ibn Maslama and his soldiers from the Muslims who were on guard, they captured these 50 people. They uh, discovered them and they captured them. And they were brought, brought to the Prophet ﷺ as captives. At the same time, there were some minor skirmishes between Khalid ibn al-Walid's army who was still standing with his army on guard and uh, close to the Muslim army. There were some minor skirmishes. One of the Sahabis also was killed in these skirmishes. There were some pelting of stones, shooting of arrows that occurred, but very minor skirmishes. And um, because of that, um, uh, because of these Meccans being captured by the Prophet Sallallahu um, and Uthman radiallahu anhu and these Muslims who had gone to Mecca who were still in Mecca um, the Meccans when they found out that their men have been captured they prevented Uthman from returning and they stopped Uthman radiallahu anhu and the Muslims that they had uh, discovered in Mecca and they uh, captured them and they kept them back when they kept Uthman radiallahu anhu back a rumor spread to the Muslims that Uthman anhu has been killed. He has been assassinated, right, on his way back. The Meccans grabbed him and they killed him. When this rumor spread amongst the Muslims, this uh, only aggravated the situation. First and foremost, the Sahaba who were desirous of entering Mecca to perform their Umrah, they had been so patient so far that they had been prevented. They were ready to go to war with the Meccans because they knew that the Prophet's dream is, is true, it's gonna happen. And we're ready to give our life for it. So they were ready to go to war and then this news comes to them that the Meccans have killed Uthman radiallahu anhu. When the Prophet sallallahu heard this, he also was affected. He uh, was sitting under a tree. And all of this is mentioned in this surah. The dream of the Prophet ﷺ, there's verses that refer to it. This whole incident of the, the tree and the Prophet ﷺ pledging with the Sahaba. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting under a tree and he called out to all the Sahaba saying, Come and pledge bay'ah to me that we will uh, avenge the death of Uthman anhu till the last one of us. That we will die in avenging the death, death of the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning we will fight till the end. All of the Sahaba anhu, came and pledged, they put their hand and the hand of the Prophet anhu, and they pledged that we will fight till death and avenge the, the death of Uthman anhu, the, the assassination of Uthman. The Prophet anhu, every Sahabi came and they pledged their bay'ah. The Prophet anhu, to the extent said that I am also pledging on behalf of Uthman that Uthman was because he was not there. So he put one of his hands on the other and says this hand is Uthman's hand. And I'm making bay'at on behalf of Uthman too, on my hand. And this was like a great honor for Uthman radiallahu later on, that the Prophet sallallahu used his hand, his own blessed hand, to represent the hand of Uthman radiallahu Nevertheless, after this bay'at took place, and Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Fatih, Allah was extremely happy with this uh, you know, show of uh, uh, enthusiasm, sincerity and their willingness to die for the sake of Allah. Allah was extremely happy with all of these Sahaba radiallahu anhum, each and every one of them, and which is mentioned in the verses inshallah we will cover. Eventually the news, the, the true information got to the Prophet ﷺ, no Uthman has not been killed, he has just been kept back. And then the Meccans sent a message that we will let Uthman come back and the Muslims that we have captured if you return our captives. And there was a captive exchange. The Meccans were sent back. The Prophet ﷺ sent them back without harming them. And Uthman was able to rejoin the army with the Prophet ﷺ. Eventually, the, the Meccans, they sent out Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr also came on behalf of the Meccans to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. So initially he spoke to the Prophet ﷺ. He got the same message from the Prophet ﷺ, came back to the Meccan and said, look, we might as well. Uh, these people are uh, 
you know, they have no intention of war. They only they are only here for pilgrimage. It's best in our best interest. We don't go to where we're them. They're so enthusiastic. They're ready to die for the sake of Allah. They're ready to go to war. It's better that we don't engage with them, right? And in the meantime, Allah had uh, struck awe in the hearts of this disbelievers. And in the, you know, over the days, all the desertion that occurred, many of the tribes that had left the Mankans, this also, um, you know, weakened their resolve. They became soft. They weakened their resolve. And eventually they said, okay, they told Suhail ibn Amr, okay, you know what, go out and try to agree upon some truce with the Prophet Sallallahu So Suhail ibn Amr was sent again with Huwaita uh, uh, ibn Abdul Uzza and another one of the Meccans, three of them went out to negotiate with the Prophet Sallallahu a truce. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Suhail coming, because Suhail, the, the name Suhail is from the root word Sahlun. Sahl means easy or soft. When the Prophet Sallallahu saw Suhail coming, he says, Sahul al-Amr, he said, he took a good omen saying, now the matter is going to be resolved, right? Because Suhail is coming. He's coming with softness. He, the Meccans have softened up now. So now they will agree to some terms. So Suhail ibn Amr came and he expressed the willingness of the Meccans to agree to some terms of uh, a truce. Inshallah, we'll have to pause here. Um, we'll speak about the conditions of the truce. Uh, this is why it's called Sulhul Hudaybiyah. The word Sulhun means truce or agreement. Sulhun, Saad, Lam, Ha. And Hudaybiyah because this Sulh, this truce, this treaty was agreed upon in Hudaybiyah. This is why it's called Sulhul Hudaybiyah. So inshallah, to be continued, we'll continue with the agreement that was made and the eventual return of the Prophet Sallallahu in the Sahaba after this agreement. And that will take us, inshallah, to the revelation of these verses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to become sincere for the sake of Allah and His Rasul. May Allah fill our hearts with love for Allah and His Rasul like the Sahaba radiallahu anhum whose hearts were full of love for Allah and His Rasul, that they were ready to give everything for His sake. May Allah give us the tawfiq too. May Allah give victory to Islam and Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist all of those who are in the state of oppression, persecution. May Allah relieve them. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana al-mustad'afeen al-mazlumina fi kulli makan khasatan fi Palestine. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana اللهم انصرهم اللهم ارحم ضعفهم واجبر كسرهم وتول أمرهم اللهم عجل بنصرهم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم منزل الكتاب ومجري السحاب وهازم الأحزاب اهزم أعداء الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم اهزمهم وانصرنا عليهم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نجعلك في نحورهم ونعوذ بك من شرورهم اللهم من أراد بالإسلام شرا وبالمسلمين شرا فأشغلهم بأنفسهم واجعل كيدهم في نحورهم واجعل تدبيرهم تنميرهم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للقوم الظالمين ونجنا برحمتك من القوم الكافرين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم فرج هم المهمومين من المؤمنين ونفس كرب المكروبين وقض الدين عن المدينين واشف مرضانا ومرض المسلمين وارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين اللهم ارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين اللهم ارحم أمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اغفر لأمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم تجاوز عن أمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم انصر أمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم احفظ وعافي أمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم ردنا ورد المسلمين إليك ردا جميلا اللهم ردنا ورد المسلمين إليك ردا جميلا اللهم ردنا ورد المسلمين إليك ردا جميلا ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتبع علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا رب